Good evening. It's good to see everybody out this evening. I'm open to uh, page 66 in your workbook. Page 66. Actually, page 65. I'm on the wrong page. <clears throat> page 66, 65. Goodness. Great start tonight, huh? Page 65. We're talking about uh, premillennialism. And uh, we got a good ways down, uh, probably halfway through the lesson here. And uh, just kind of going back through what we talked about uh, Sunday, that uh, the, the, the basis of premillennialism is, is basically uh, coming out of Revelation 20. Uh, we see uh, three different sections of Revelation 20, the first one being uh, the binding of Satan, and uh, the binding of Satan uh, evidently happening here on earth, and then also the thousand-year reign. Um, and uh, the premillennialistic view of this is that everything is going to happen physically here on earth. Uh, that the thousand-year reign of Christ will be uh, taking place here on earth, and also the binding of Satan uh, will be here on earth. And then after that will be the final judgment um, after the, the thousand-year reign of Christ. And so we, we talked about that uh, in, in great, great detail Sunday. And we're picking up uh, with the nature of the kingdom, the uh, second section there on page 65. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to uh, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 28. Daniel chapter 2, beginning around verse 28. So this is Daniel talking about, um, he's explaining one of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. Daniel 2, beginning in verse 28, says, But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of man, men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the, of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall rise another kingdom inferior to yours, and then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall, partly, shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to the other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And so that's kind of a, a lengthy reading there, but uh, basically what uh, we're taking from it uh, for the por uh, purpose of this class is that Daniel prophesied uh, that during the third kingdom to reign 
after Babylon, an eternal kingdom would be set up. And we know that kingdom uh, would be the kingdom of Christ, and it would shatter all the other kingdoms that have come before it, all the kingdoms that will come after it, and uh, it will be eternal. And so that was a, a prophecy uh, of uh, the church being set up. And so now let's go to uh, Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Luke chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iteria, and the region of Tracon Traconitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So I'm noticing a, a couple of things here that I didn't notice in my studies. Um, but a, a couple of things here I'm seeing, um, I'm trying to put my thoughts together on this, but, but firstly being that the prophecy of Daniel has come true, uh, that, that we now have um, the, the third kingdom to rule after Babylon uh, was the Roman uh, Empire. And so at this time, this was when uh, Daniel, Daniel's prophecy about this came true. Uh, but another, another thing is that Isaiah's words uh, kind of resemble the words of Daniel. Uh, you know, talking about, you know, e every, uh, verse 6 specifically, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. That's a kingdom that Daniel talked about that is going to crush all the other kingdoms. That the, 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 uh, Daniel talks about a kingdom that's going to go out into all the world, you know. And so this kind of reminds me of, of just, you know, an entirely uh, fulfilled prophecy of Daniel uh, there in uh, Luke chapter 3. Any questions, comments? Okay, so now um, we have Jesus' statements about the kingdom. Uh, let's turn to John chapter 18. John chapter 18, beginning in verse 33. John 18, beginning in verse 33. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. And so uh, one of the first statements we have here of Jesus uh, is that his kingdom was not of this world. And so uh, why this is important to our class is that uh, the, the premillennialistic view of Revelation 20 is that Jesus is going to come again and he's going to physically reign on earth uh, for a thousand years. But Jesus says here that his kingdom isn't of this world. And he says something that's pretty obvious that if it was of this world, my servants would fight. You know, if I was trying to set up an earthly kingdom, my servants would be fighting tooth and nail over, uh, over me right now. But uh, because it's not, you know, I'm not going to give up any, you know, I'm not going to give you a fight or anything like that. So uh, that only makes sense. Uh, and so first off, Jesus declared that his kingdom was not of this world. Uh, any questions, comments regarding this? Brandon? Did he say that he was the 
good human was of this world, who could he have been called down his anger? Who could he call down the anger of the world? That's and right. You just mop out everybody and can be and everybody right. can and pose for themselves so you can just calm down and stop and learn to hate this man. Sure. And another thing that emphasizes what you just said is in first Thessalonians four. And uh This we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be the Lord forever and ever set his foot on the earth. Amen. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, again, just emphasizing that his kingdom is not of this world. Um, so, uh, absolutely. But that's his kingdom. You can't see him in the words that they could sit around with. Mm -hmm. But they said, well, uh, that's him that's working of this world. <laughs> and uh, he's just going to be of this world. Sure. You know, you, you just, there's not a... Because it plainly says so. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then uh, that next here to prove it, you know, is it or is it? I haven't, but we can get into that. <laughs> yeah, it just says it was uh, not come with thoughts of boasting. Well, of course, then everything that they believe, you know, it's going to be thoughts of boasting. Right. You know, so. Absolutely. No, their, their, their theory or it just doesn't add up. Sure. Van? But he wasn't able to. Hmm. And so because of that, he's going to come back and set up the earthly kingdom. Hmm. If you ever thought with him, that's, that's one of the things that they'll say. Uh, of course, they say a lot of things because they, you know, when you, when you quote scripture like we have tonight, they'll come up with some other Right. That's what their view is, that Jesus failed. He sure. didn't do what he came to earth to do. So he had to leave, but he's coming back. And this time, he's going to come back with, with enough power to do it. Right. And, and so, uh, it, it, people, I mean, when I was there, you know, it was, it was exciting to think that uh, Jesus is going to come back and kill everybody that's ever been mean to you. Or all these nations. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, it talks about uh, in, in Revelation, an army from the north will come in, and a fellow told me, he said, get out your map and put a ruler on Jerusalem and put it directly straight up, and you'll run right into Moscow. <laughs> he said, that's where they're coming from. And he, he put the ruler on it, it will go to Moscow. <laughs> Yeah. Do they think that it's going to be a second chance when it comes again and sets up that kingdom? Just look yeah. how stupid that is. When the people that think they're going to have a second chance and knowing what all they know and about the appearing of the Lord and everything, what chance do you, well, how much, how many of them going to turn to the Lord then? All of them. You know, so they see all this power mm -hmm. and everything. So it's going to, the Lord's going to be shut. Yeah. I can't understand them thinking anybody's going to have a well, you know, I uh, just to kind of 
sum up what you and Van were talking about. This afternoon, I texted my group chat with my guys. I've got, you know, I've told you all about that group chat with Dexter and Andrew and all of them. And I texted them. I said, well, I'm, I'm teaching class tonight on premillennialism. And one of them, I think it was Dexter. Dexter said, good luck saying that 50 times tonight. <laughs> and then uh, my brother-in-law, Carson, he sent me a video. And uh, he had written out on his chalkboard, what you have to believe if you believe premillennialism. And he took his Bible and just threw it in the trash. And I mean that tells you what you need to what you need to know and and believe to accept premillennialism. That if you're going to accept this doctrine, then you're throwing away what Jesus said. You're throwing away what the apostles after him said, and you're you're throwing away the prophecies that were made about this kingdom. And, and you're throwing all that away, um, you know. And, and talking about the second chance, Mr. Dan, we uh, I was talking to Dale Sunday morning, and we brought up he brought up uh, different prisoners that. You know, they've, they've been given second chances, third chances, fourth chances, and, you know, they, they might have wound up in prison four or five times. So there's going to be people that will turn to the Lord maybe in their second chance, but there's going to be a whole lot more that are just going to do the same thing they're, they're doing, you know. And, uh, um, you know, so what we emphasized Sunday was that our second chance is that we woke up today. You know, I, I, we're living our second chance right now. So. commercial out. I don't know what he's advertising except to be an atheist and it's uh, Ronald Reagan's son, the young the youngest one. Is he Ron Reagan Jr. or know. something? I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, and he says, I'm an atheist. I'm a proud atheist. I'm always going to be one, you know, and he says all these things and it's just, it's horrible, you know, mm -hmm. and all, and uh, so, uh, you know, he's got a surprise coming, you know, to him, but this, I didn't know this, a lot of people thought that, uh, when I was reading this this afternoon, <clears throat> that Muhammad or some of them, you know, might have been the Antichrist, and I didn't, I didn't know, but it, it brings that up in, in here, too, right. so it's, it's this book for, he probably got to get you help, it's real good. Well, anyway, um, <coughs> those are some good comments there, and I appreciate it. But uh, you know, getting back to the lesson here, you know, the, the thing that we're looking at is that you, know, you have the, the premillennial idea that everything is going to be physical, and the first st statement that Jesus makes that we look at is that his kingdom is not of this world. Uh, that was John 18. And then now let's look at the second one. Uh, he declared the kingdom would not come with observation, but was within. So let's go to Luke chapter 17. And let's pick up the verse 20. Luke 17, beginning in verse 20. Beginning in verse 20. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here, or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. And so getting back to, uh, to Van's point, the, uh, the Jews, the Pharisees here, they were asking, well, when, you know, when is the kingdom of God going to come? When is this, you know, uh, again, thinking physically, when is this going to happen? And Jesus says, it's not going to come with observation. There's not going to be a time when you can point over there and say, see there, or see here. It, it's, it's going to be within you. And so that... Um, that again just shows us the idea that it's not a physical kingdom that's going to be set up. Brandon? Mine says that it is in the midst of you. 
In the midst of it? Yeah, that's when the end was standing. I like okay. that right there, but there it's got that extra tendency. He's in the midst of it. Don't let them know it's just right now. Mm-hmm. It's right now. Right. Absolutely. So it's it's something that was being set up uh, even, even right then. So good point there. It's not something that's going to be observed uh, with the eyes, uh, as Jesus says here. Uh, then number three, uh, Jesus declared that some who were alive then would not die until they saw the kingdom come with power. Uh, that's Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. Mark 9, beginning in verse 1, it says, And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. And so I'll just tell you, if that's the case, we ought to have some pretty old folks in the world. But we don't. We don't have any, any you know, 2,024-year-old people in the world today. Um, and, and so this kingdom, uh, this kingdom of God, uh, that Jesus is talking about. He, he's talking about ultimately his death and resurrection. That there were some alive at this point in time when Mark 9 and verse 1 was written um, that you know they were going to be alive uh, and, and see the, the power of God, the, the kingdom of God being set up through Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross. That's what he's talking about. Um, any thoughts, questions, comments on that? There uh, was a series of books a while back left behind Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think that has something to do with the rapture. Now, I never read any of them, but uh, I knew a lady that was reading those books, and I thought, you shouldn't be reading that. I mean, I mean, unless you just wanted to know what it said, right. because it's, it's just teaching false doctrine, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, it was pretty popular there for, I don't know, that could have been 20 years ago, I can't remember. I got you. Yeah, so again, you know, Jesus declares that some who were alive then would not die until they saw the kingdom come with power. Again, this points not to a physical kingdom that's going to be set up, but uh, in fact a, a spiritual kingdom, uh, a kingdom that we can observe, a kingdom that's not of this world. Um, let's move on to uh, number four. With this, Jesus declared plainly that his kingdom is not earthly, observable, or to be established later than the lifetime of some who were alive in the first century. Um, and so again, that just goes to show uh, that it's not a physical, not a physical kingdom that's going to be set up. It's in fact uh, something that's not going to be observed, uh, an eternal kingdom. Um, so moving on to C, the apostles' statements about the kingdom. Uh, number one, Paul told the Colossians that Christ had already translated them into the kingdom. Uh, that's Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 beginning in verse 13. Here. I think I think our author uses a a different version that uses the word tran, uh, translate or transfer translate. Anyway, it's it's the idea. Let, let me read the verses and I'll I'll tell you about the idea behind it. Colossians one, uh, beginning in verse thirteen. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And so Paul told the Colossians that Christ had already translated them into the kingdom. So that's the idea of he, um, you know, what Christ has done for us is he's, he's made it possible for us to be in the kingdom uh, while we're physically here. And so it's this idea of he's translated them into the kingdom um, and conveyed them from uh, this world of sin and darkness into the kingdom. And so this kingdom, you know, again, uh, it's not talking about a physical kingdom. You know, we're not, we're not in a physical kingdom today, but we are in a spiritual kingdom, uh, even while we are alive right now. But we're, we're in the kingdom of God because we have uh, believed and obeyed the words of Jesus Christ and uh, the apostles as well. So uh, if that has already taken place uh, here in Colossians 1 with these first century Christians, 
uh, then that would tell you that the, the kingdom had already come at that point in time. And it was not a kingdom that was set up, you know, physically here on this world. So, any questions, comments regarding that? Hey, Henderson, uh, yeah. They would say that if you need to say. Does it? Let me look at that real quick. So, yeah, it, again, it's just that idea that it's, it's transferred us almost, kind of, kind of like conveyor. It uses the word uh, convey, conveyed us. So it's taken us from this place and it's putting us in this place. But um, uh, the idea is that we're, we're not physically moved in, into a, a physical kingdom. We're, we're spiritually moved into a, a kingdom. So, um, so that was the, the uh, Apostle Paul there. Then number two, John spoke of those alive when he lived uh, who were his brothers and companions in the kingdom of Revelation 1 and verse 9. Revelation 1 and verse 9. Verse 9 says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he uses the word, uh, John uses the word kingdom here. And uh, he's talking about that I'm both your brother and I'm also your companion in this kingdom. And so uh, John spoke of those alive when he lived who were his brothers and companions in the kingdom. Now this wasn't a physical kingdom that John and these people were a part of. This was a spiritual kingdom that he was writing. You know, he was he was writing to, and he was writing. Uh, if you back up to verse four, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. So he's talking to the first century, uh, first century Christians here, and uh, he's talking about people that were alive in the first century. So they were already a part um, of this kingdom, this spiritual kingdom that has been set up. Uh, so again, the idea is not a physical kingdom. And even uh, So we have Paul's words on this and also John's here. Uh, and then number three, it's clear that the very apostle who wrote the promises of the thousand year reign already understood Christ to be reigning over him and others. And so that's a, that's a good way to put it, that John understood that the kingdom had already been set up. It's not something that would come and Jesus would reign for a thousand years. Uh, it's something that has already been set up for eternity. All right, so uh, I hope that what you've seen is that we've had Jesus' words on this, we've had the apostles' words on this, and they don't hint in, in any way whatsoever that the kingdom uh, that would be established, or, or, you know, that would be established is, is coming to be here on earth. Uh, it's already been set up uh, for eternity. We, we sometimes use words, maybe not on the kingdom, but we'll say, um, say the church, i got to go to church. Well, that's really not right. You know, and, uh, uh, someone one time I was saying the church building, and they asked me, well, why do you say that to me? And I said, well, because, you know, the church is the people, you know, and the kingdom is the, is the people, and that's why we don't see it. And so sometimes we use phrases or words that are inappropriate, you sure. know, and we might, might lead to some confusion on other people's parts, you know. So the uh, kingdom's already come because all of us here are in that in that kingdom, mm -hmm. you know. So we need, right. to, we need to pay attention to our words sometimes. Sure, absolutely. Any other thoughts or questions or comments on this? Okay, so that moves us on to uh, the third section here. When will the saints be caught up to meet him? Uh, let's turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. 
For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Starting in chapter 5. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So, what we see here concerning uh, the resurrection and Jesus' is coming uh, is that, first off, uh, when Jesus returns, he will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus, uh, not just the martyrs. And number two, when Jesus returns, the dead in Christ will rise. And this, uh, this must be what Revelation chapter 20 calls the second resurrection. I thought about that for a second. And if you, if you go back to Revelation 20, and uh, y'all can do it a little bit later, you don't have to do it right now, but Revelation 20, it talks about, you know, the, uh, the first resurrection and the second resurrection. I, I, this is just me talking off the cuff. I'm not saying this is true or anything, but I, I'm hoping that it is, and y'all correct me if I'm wrong. But number one, uh, when you look at when Jesus returns, he will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So I'm thinking that, you know, if somebody wants to say there's two resurrections, um, that you might can make that point here from 1 Thessalonians 4, that the first resurrection are going to be those who are dead in Christ, the ones that have already been dead. Maybe the second res resurrection that's being talked about in Revelation 20 is those who are alive and present when Jesus comes. Uh, so that, that very well may be uh, the, the two resurrections that John might have seen uh, in Revelation 20. So... I don't know if that maybe corresponds with that. I could be wrong on that, but it, it's just a thought that came across my mind that, you know, if somebody wasn't in favor of two resurrections, that might be uh, something that can be used there. Yes, sir. Well, I've spent a lot of time thinking about those two resurrections, and uh, like you, I, I don't know whether the, the thoughts that I come to, the conclusion is good or not, but uh, I couldn't. The first thing I thought of was about when Jesus was raised from the dead, the grave was open. Mm -hmm. Well, that don't fit the context. The next resurrection I'm thinking about, when every person that is born and comes to a knowledge of good and evil and chooses evil is dead spiritually, except Jesus. He's the only one, and all the rest is, didn't come to live without sin. So if, if they're dead, that made me think that Jesus one reason he said you must be born again to be born again is when you become a new creature it'd be spiritually speaking and there in uh, in Romans we're talking about a person when he has died with Christ in the watery graves of baptism and raised to walk in newness of life he's a new creature in Christ and I've been thinking in my own mind that that would be the second, no, no the first resurrection. Mm -hmm. And then Judgment Day, the second resurrection is not going to have no effect on them because they are in Christ if they should remain faithful to the dead. But uh, I even catch myself thinking about this during the night. If I wake up, I'll be thinking about these. <laughs> it's, it's, yes, uh, it's hard to get settled on it and be... Right. I was just thinking in terms of Revelation 20 that uh, concerning the saints, it talks about two resurrections. So I, I didn't know if this uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 might, might correspond with it in that way um, or, or not. It, it could, but it, um, it, it may not. But I was just throwing that, throwing that out there. That's something that I saw as, as we went along here. Um, and then secondly, what we see uh, in this passage, uh, the B part, uh, it says that uh, meet the Lord in the air. Uh, the saved will meet the Lord in the air and always be with the Lord. There is no uh, indication that Jesus will return to the earth itself. The heaven and earth will be destroyed at his return. So that's 
Uh, let's turn to 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. And starting in verse 10. Second Peter 3 and verse 10. Beginning in verse 10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And so uh, it, it tells us here that there's no indication that Jesus is going to come back, uh, you know, physically here on this earth. And the uh, you know, a, a thought that I had uh, after Sunday morning's class was that, you know, if these people believe that, uh, you know, the, the premillennialistic view is that uh, Jesus is going to come back and, you know, physically and he's going to reign for a thousand years. But then you look at 2 Peter 3 and it tells us that when Jesus comes again, it's gonna, everything's going to melt. What's he going to reign over? You know, if he's supposed to reign for a thousand years, but then 2 Peter 3 says that the elements are going to melt when he comes back. What's he supposed to reign over for a thousand years? You know, there, there's going to be nothing left for him to reign over. So, again, it, it kind of gets back to that funny illustration that my, my brother-in-law sent me this afternoon, that if, if you believe this, then you just got to throw out everything that's been written. You know, everything that has been written about the second coming and, and what's supposed to happen, you just kind of got to throw it out. Um, so, uh, again, all this just points to... Uh, points to a uh, an eternal kingdom that uh, that cannot be seen or observed, uh, just like Jesus said. Any thoughts, questions on that? The global warning is not going to take place because we use fossil fuels. The global warming is when Christ comes, and all these elements are going to be dissolved with fervent heat. They won't have to be worried about what the next day is going to bring. Mr. Dan, you want to get up in a political speech and say something like that? <laughs> I've actually thought about writing to Senator Spectre Tuberville and asking him if he could read that scripture there before them in the audience and have somebody to comment on what it says. <laughs> oh. Dale, do you have something? No, sir. I just All right. good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So, uh, Again, the Savior will meet the Lord in the air and always be with the Lord. Uh, there's no indication that Jesus will return to the earth itself, that heaven and earth will be destroyed at his return. Uh, and then finally, here we have, there is no indication that those caught up will be separated from Jesus, thus being spared for some, from some tribulation or awaiting an earthly kingdom. Passages that refer to some taken and some left properly refer to either the destruction of Jerusalem and those take, taken captive, or being taken in judgment, not to some pre-kingdom rapture. And so the idea here uh, is that, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it's talking about the rapture where some are going to be taken and some are going to be left uh, for destruction. And uh, to, to my understanding, it seems that the people that are that are supposed to be left here on earth, uh, they, they're going to be in tribulation and all of this. And the people that are left here on earth that are supposed to be in tribulation, Jesus will come and reign over them for a thousand years. That's that's what I under, understand about that. But uh, when it when it says, you know, those those are going to be caught up, the elements are going to melt, you know, everything's going to be uh, judged. Uh, it doesn't say anything about a rapture or some being left or some being taken. It, it doesn't mention anything about that. It says that. You know, the elements are going to melt. Those that are righteous will be, you know, those that are saved will be caught up in the air and they'll be with him uh, forever. So uh, that's, you know, again, just no indication of these things. Any questions, comments, for the conclusions? Yes, sir. We just have to always remember that uh, a lot of these terms are figurative. You can't take them literal. Right. Uh, the thousand years is a figurative term. It's not, you don't get the calendar marked off. 1,000 times 365. And uh, again, back to that verse in, in Revelation, uh, John was told to write the things which have been, which are, and which will be. And a lot of this tribulation has already occurred 
at the time John was writing this in 1996, I think is what most people think it was. Sure. Jerusalem's already been destroyed, so that was a tribulation. Uh, the Roman emperors, uh, they, they've had some horrible ones, and, and the one that had just been preceding this was Domitian, Domitian I think is the way you pronounce his name, and he, he was bloodthirsty. So uh, they could relate to this type of language and things. Uh, we have a hard time relating to it and people today, so they want to make it some big battle thing that, that's going to that's gonna happen. Right. Uh, and we don't have the tribulation like they had it, but we might the way our government's going. And so this is to give us comfort and hope. And uh, don't put faith in the government. You know, this government falls, Christ still reigns, his kingdom still marches on. Uh, and so we, we need to lose hope, uh, but we should be proud to suffer for the cause of Christ. Sure. Consider it an honor, Paul said. And you know, that's where our focus needs to be. This thing will play out like God, you know, knows it will. Uh, and his will won't be done in everything. Uh, and his will's not done. It is in heaven, but his will's not necessarily done in earth. Uh, is evidenced by the vast majority of people. So uh, we just have to understand there's going to be what to us looks like defeat of the cause of Christ, maybe. Uh, victories here and there, but it looks like we're going to be overwhelmed. Uh, that's the way we feel back in that day of time. Sure. And uh, that may be for a time, you know. God causes uh, us to have uh, bad leaders and, and uh, tragic events like 9-11, which had everybody in, the, in you know, the, you come in contact with talking about religion again. Uh, you know, the, it, as a whole in the United States, what they call church attendance went up dr dramatically right after 9-11. Well, that, you know, that causes people to think about God. Now, they don't always come to the right Conclusion, but uh, those things happen for a reason, and also to let us know that you know any of us can be taken at any time. Don't, you know, don't think we're here for the duration. Sure. We think that you know these things that it talks about. You know that we think well, nothing like that's ever happened. But this book <laughs> that I keep pushing, it it says there were like a million hundred thousand people that died. You know, and now and then that the flood put out some of the fires that they built because it was, you know, so bad. And we can't relate to anything like that. But these horrible things have happened because they, it's not in the Bible, but history tells us, of, you know, these things. And so, uh, I don't, I don't believe we'll go through anything like that again. But it could be. Good. You know? mm -hmm. That's right. Yes, ma'am. Go back to. Peter 3 and just just read aloud verses 3 through 8 three and I think eight. that has a lot to do with it it talks about the old world and it was old bloody but then what it is reserved for the next but just, just read that for us alright uh, Second Peter 3 beginning in verse 3 knowing this first that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, will, for this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Uh, but, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years one day. So, uh, yeah, that, that definitely, that says a lot about, about this, that, um, you know, pe people today are, are a lot like that. Where, you know, where, where is the promise of this coming? You know, it, the, the world still spins around at so many miles per hour, and we're still here living day to day. So where's the promise of it coming? 
Um, so yeah, we're, we're kind of reverting back to, uh, to the free flood where people are just kind of, you know, living how they, how they want to live, you know, however that is. And, um, just as those people were surprised when the flood started to happen, people are going to be surprised when the, when the uh, earth is caught on fire again. So you know, it's, like the Lord not good. counting time like we do. Right. Just think of it. Eternity is hard to grasp. It never ends. It's forever. Like one day to us, you know, 24 hours, but a thousand years to God could be maybe even a, a day or, or it'd be since it's eternal, it'd be even less a split second or more. There ain't no such thing. In other words, it's just something that does not end. Eternity is something that's hard to comprehend. That's right. So if it says something is near, well, if, even if it's a thousand years, that's still near as far as eternity is concerned because sure. it's of the way he reckons time. Absolutely. Well, that's all the time we've got for uh, this morning. Um, we'll pick up here Sunday morning and um, let's see, we'll probably begin uh, our next book Sunday morning as well. So I'll, I'll pass those out. Um, Sunday morning, and uh, we'll, we'll pick up on that new book. It's going to be on uh, the authority of the scriptures, uh, and so we'll we'll pick up there on Sunday morning. Thank y'all for your comments tonight.